Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Ask the Expert virtual open house. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Carla Salp, and I'm the Public Engagement Specialist for the Washington State Department of Agriculture. In a few moments, we'll begin by sharing background information on the gypsy moth, an invasive species that is among the most damaging pests in the United States. We'll share what we found during last year's trapping season, why this is such a problem, and our proposed project to eradicate the gypsy moth in areas where they've been detected. You will hear from those coordinating the response and others from organizations concerned with the damage the gypsy moth can cause in our forests, the environment, not to mention the trees in our backyards and community parks. Feel free to submit a question at any time via the chat box in the WebEx meeting system. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation. You will experience the best quality by closing other programs on your computer and only running the webinar. And just so you are aware, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available within the next week. Speaking today will be Jim Mara, manager of the PEST program, Barbara Morrissey with the Washington State Department of Health, Justin Bush with the Washington Invasive Species Council, Clinton Campbell with the U.S. Department of Agriculture APHIS program, and myself. Now we'll start with our first presenter, Dr. Mara. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for um, uh, attending our um, Gypsy Moth webinar. Uh, I am the pest program manager of the Washington State Department of Agriculture, and our agency is proposing to do a Gypsy Moth eradication in the spring of this year. Uh, the Gypsy Moth program is one of our highest priority programs within the Plant Protection Division and within our agency. And today, we're going to talk about why the program is important and uh, what people can expect uh, that's going to happen within the program over the next several months. So um, the gypsy moth is a non-native species that's native to Europe and Asia. It was uh, brought to the United States by a French naturalist named Leopold Trouvelot in 1869. He brought the uh, gypsy moth eggs uh, to his home in Medford, Massachusetts, uh, in order to breed a new uh, species of silkworm moth, which he was able to do. He failed at doing so, but in the process, he uh, accidentally released gypsy moth eggs into his backyard, which initiated uh, the establishment of uh, gypsy moth in uh, Massachusetts. And from that single household in Medford, Massachusetts, Gypsy moth eventually spread to its current uh, status of infesting permanently some 20 states in the Northeast and Midwest. Um, a single female can lay up to or over uh, 100 individuals in a single egg mass. And it kind of speaks of the destructive potential of uh, the gypsy moth in that it could reach very large populations in a very short period of time, resulting in the defoliation of many hundreds of thousands, even millions of acres in a single year. It feeds on over 500 species of trees and shrubs, uh, including uh, many species that we have here, many native species we have here in uh, the state of Washington. So these are some pictures of some defoliation that's occurred back east recently in the Northeast States. This is uh, uh, photos uh, that of, of defoliation events that have occurred in New Jersey. Uh, uh, Gypsy moth uh, goes through these erupted cycles every five to 10 years where uh, it undergoes these explosive populations and defoliates uh, many hundreds of thousands or even a million or more acres. And uh, 2015 and 2016 were particularly bad years. Um, some of the worst defoliation years in several decades. <clears throat> uh, this is some photos of uh, defoliation that occurred in Pennsylvania. Uh, Penn Pennsylvania uh, underwent some nine, excuse me, some 700,000 acres of defoliation during this time. Connecticut went, uh, underwent some 400,000 acres of defoliation and 900. 
6,000 acres were defoliated in the state of Massachusetts. So these were an enormous uh, defoliation events that occurred during this period. As a point of comparison, if we were to compare that to defoliation by the spruce budworm, a native defoliator in Washington state, in a very bad year, we would expect to experience somewhere between uh, 200 to 400,000 acres. So by any standard, these are enormous defoliation events and something that we wouldn't want to see occur in Washington state. Whoops, wrong way. Uh, so this is a map of the current status of the infestation of gypsy moth and its predicted future spread. It's estimated that uh, about one third of the potential area that can support gypsy moth populations has cur is currently being infested by gypsy moth, which means some two thirds of uh, the habitat in the, U the U.S. that could support gypsy moth populations has yet to be colonized by gypsy moth. There are currently 20 states that are infested and gypsy moth is moving at a rate of about six to 12 miles per year, depending upon uh, which part of uh, the infested area that uh, you're looking at. So the gypsy moth is permanently infested as far west as Minnesota and as far south as North Carolina. And still expanding. So I'm going to talk briefly about the uh, life history stages of the gypsy moth. There are four distinct life history stages, the larvae uh, pupil stage, the adult, and uh, the egg stage. Uh, this is obviously the caterpillar stage. This is the destructive uh, stage of the gypsy moth. It's the feeding stage during which most of the damage occurs. You have their voracious feeders of, uh, of leaves. Uh, the, they are very distinctive. There are five rows of blue dots, six rows of uh, red dots, and we don't have a comparable uh, species of caterpillar that looks like that here in Washington. So this is uh, a picture of uh, male and female adults. As you can see, the adults are sexually bimorphic. The males are a different color, size, and shape of the females. The female are white. The uh, males are dark brown. Uh, the, the adult stage is the non-feeding stage. They only live for a few days uh, to a week or more. And even though the female, the, the white moth in the photo, has wings, the European uh, gypsy moth female is not flight capable. It's not capable of flight, greatly restricting its ability to disperse once it's introduced into a particular area. So uh, these are some photographs of gypsy moth egg masses. Uh, a single egg mass can contain anywhere from several hundred to well over a thousand individuals in a single egg mass. It is a very uh, environmental resistant stage for uh, gypsy moth. Uh, it uh, is the overwintering stage, and it's a state that more often uh, is transported into Washington, uh, attached to outdoor household articles, uh, recreational vehicles, even nursery stock, brought to the state either people moving here or recreating in our state and depositing gypsy moths in our state in the, during the process. And they can well survive the kinds of freezing temperatures that uh, we're experiencing in Washington right now. So we have several species of moths that people report as being gypsy moths in our state. The, uh, Tent caterpillar and the fall white worm. The tent caterpillar produces these uh, tent-like structures in uh, the spring. The fall white worm in late summer, uh, early fall. Uh, these are uh, very common, very widespread native species that people often report, but these are not uh, gypsy moths. Uh, they don't do anywhere near the damage that gypsy moths do. Uh, and uh, we, our agency does not have a program for controlling uh, these two species. So 
So the gypsy moth, uh, there are two varieties of gypsy moth, the Asian gypsy moth and the European gypsy moth. And even though they're the same species, they, uh, their native range is in different geographic areas and they have different life history characteristics. Uh, one of the most important being that unlike the European gypsy moth female, the Asian gypsy moth female can fly up to 20 miles. That means once it's introduced in a particular area, it could spread uh, much more quickly and become established much faster than the European gypsy moth. Uh, in addition, it, it survives uh, much better on conifer vegetation than the European variety, which is of great concern here in Washington since our state is dominated by conifers. So as bad as the European gypsy moth is, we have even greater concerns about the risk of Asian gypsy moth than the, and the risk that it presents to our state. We have caught uh, and are proposing eradication programs for both the Asian gypsy moth and European gypsy moth, which I'll talk more about uh, in a few minutes. Unlike the European gypsy moth, there are no reproducing populations of Asian gypsy moth anywhere in North America at the present time. So uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, gypsy moth, there are no permanent populations in Washington at this time. If gypsy moth were to become permanently established in our state, we could expect periodic defoliation events on a scale of hundreds of thousands of acres. Uh, that would put millions of acres of commercial forest land at risk. It would put millions of acres of national parks and state parks at risk, and uh, as well as important industries. And if gypsy moth were to become established, we would, our certain industries, the Christmas tree in industry, timber industry, and nursery industry would be subject to costly quarantines that we restrict uh, the export of those commodities to other states and other countries. So I'm going to talk about our uh, trapping program and the results of our 2018 season. Uh, this is a map of uh, our trap deployment for uh, last year. Each one of those green symbols represent a location. Uh, where a trap was placed. We placed some 30,000 traps across the state. Excuse me, with most of the traps being placed on the uh, western half of the state where most of the gypsy moth activity occurs. Most of our catches uh, occur on the west side of the state, the more heavily populated uh, side of the state. Uh, in addition, we trap our uh, 12 marine ports very heavily in order to intercept and, mod and um, catch any uh, Asian gypsy moths that may be introduced into Washington. This map shows the results of our trap catches for 2018. Each one of those purple symbols represent a location where we have caught uh, gypsy moths. We've caught 52 gypsy moths. One of those uh, gypsy moths was an Asian gypsy moth that was caught just north of Seattle. Uh, in addition to the locations, you, what you can see is that we did have a number of sites that were multiple catch locations for gypsy moth, which is a red flag for a reproducing population. So we are uh, proposing uh, to eradicate four sites in all, which I'll talk more in greater detail in just a minute, but we are proposing to use uh, Bacillus thuringiensis or BTK as uh, a treatment against gypsy moth. It's a natural occurring bacteria, which is a pathogen of gypsy moth, and it has uh, a, a very excellent record for eradicating gypsy moth in the past. We've used it on uh, numerous occasions. It has an excellent safety record. And it is very restrictive on the types of insects that it can affect. It's restricted just to um, killing um, butterflies or moths uh, and just those that are feeding during the same time that gypsy moths are feeding. So uh, other insects like bees are not affected uh, as well as uh, fish and other mammals. And it also is certified as an organic pesticide as well. So these are the four sites that we're proposing uh, for eradication. The uh, areas treated 
uh, a total to some 1,700 acres. And that compares with some of the treatments in the infested states where hundreds of thousands of acres may be treated with pesticide. So we are doing this as part of our eradication program where some of the uh, states in the affected areas are spraying hundreds of thousand acres, not even to eradicate, but just to suppress large uh, outbreaks of this moth. So these are uh, maps of uh, the sites that, that, and the proposed treatment boundaries that we'll be using for uh, this spring's eradication program. So the uh, two sites that you see before you are two Kitsap County sites. The site on the left is uh, Crosby, which is on the west side of the county on the Hood Canal side. The uh, map on the right shows uh, our uh, treatment area for Gilberton, which is on the east side of the state, uh, of the county rather, uh, just adjacent to Puget Sound. Uh, we have caught multiple moths at these sites, at both sites, for three consecutive years. So that's pretty good evidence that there is a reproducing population present in these two locations causing us to propose the eradication program. So the Crosby uh, site is about 430 acres. The um, Gilbertson site is about 300 acres in total. Uh, these two sites, uh, the site on the left is uh, our Union Hill site, which is um, a site within King County. It's about 15 miles east of uh, Seattle, which is a uh, very much less densely populated area. It is uh, a site that again has had two consecutive years, uh, including multiple catches at this site. It's about a 270 acre proposed treatment area that we uh, attend to this spring. The site on the right is our Asian Gypsy Moth tag site. Uh, we did only catch one Asian Gypsy Moth, but because of the threat of the Asian Gypsy Moth, its ability, the female's ability to fly and disperse and establish very quickly, uh, we are proposing to do a treatment of that area as well. Uh, we are proposing about a 700, tra uh, 700, 700 acre uh, treatment area at uh, this Martha Lake location in Stohomish County, just north of Seattle. So <clears throat> uh, we're proposing to do three treatments at each site location, uh, generally uh, about uh, five to 10 days apart each treatment. Um, we uh, intend to use a fixed wing aircraft as opposed to a, a helicopter. Uh, we will monitor, we'll use several methods to determine the timing of the treatment. Uh, we have uh, co computer modeling programs that use real time weather data to predict the emergence of the larva from the egg mass that we have found to be pretty accurate. So we'll be using those modeling programs uh, as part of our decision making process. Also, we are importing sterile egg masses to monitor in the treatment area. Uh, to see when their emergence uh, occurs, when the uh, timing of the emergence may occur. And also we do monitor uh, leaf expansion during this time. And based on all these factors and the course forecast of whether we make a decision on when to do our first treatment. Once we decide on a, on a day, usually either 24 hours or maybe two days ahead of time, then we, uh, notify residents in the area through email, through text messaging, and through automated phone call messaging to let people know that we intend to do <coughs> treatments at a specific time and place. So uh, once the treatments are completed, once the three treatments are completed, um, we then, then follow up with a high density trapping program in order to evaluate the success of the treatments that we're using. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we can go two years uh, with zero catches, then we can uh, declare the eradication a success. It's three years for Asian gypsy moth as well. And of course, during the process, uh, we may be, uh, uh, have to cancel or delay our treatments if weather uh, prevents us from doing a treatment, either uh, windy conditions, rain or fog may force us to cancel 
and reschedule a particular treatment on a particular day, and that periodically happens. So with that, uh, uh, Barbara Morrissey from um, uh, Washington State Department of Health is going to uh, talk about the uh, health effects with respect to uh, B2K. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Mara. This is uh, Barb Marcy. Um, as Jim said, I, I am with the Washington State Department of Health, and I'm a toxicologist there. And just a little bit about me, I worked for more than 15 years in our pesticide program where I followed up on pesticide-related illnesses across the state and educated people about um, safest methods of pest control and how to avoid problems with pesticides. And I've also reviewed the health and safety information on the gypsy moth spray. And so today I was invited to just give a five minute overview on the safety of BTK for gypsy moth control in urban areas. And Carly, you'll need to advance my slide six. So, um, most people are interested in what, what is in the spray. So let me just talk a little bit about that. Um, as Jim mentioned, there, um, the spray, the active ingredient in the spray is a, a natural microbe um, called BTK. It's a natural disease agent in Caterpillar. So here we're really using nature to fight nature. Um, the BTK becomes active and reproduces in the gut of the caterpillar. So they have to eat it for it to be effective, um, but has not been shown to cause infections in people or act as a human pathogen. Um, second, there is a toxin. So the bacteria actually, once it's reproduced and it's growing, it makes a toxin that is a specific, it's specifically toxic to caterpillars. Um, so mammals don't have the proper conditions in our gut to activate this toxin. And we also lack the specific receptor in the caterpillar that the toxin acts on. So um, it doesn't have the same effects in people. Um, in addition to the BTK and the toxin, there, um, there is also residue of food crops that are used to grow the BTK um, in, the, in the product. Uh, there's also food additives. Um, that prevents uh, any other harmful bacteria from growing. And there's also a fair amount of water. Um, in terms of the food additives, um, all the additives that are in this uh, formulation are approved for use in food by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and they're found either naturally in foods or made for use in food products. So most people already encounter these additives in beverages, foods, and cosmetics. <clears throat> so um, as I mentioned, uh, we've also reviewed the information on the spray, including the um, full ingredient list um, for the formulation, and we concluded it was of low concern for health. Uh, we can't rule out that people who are allergic to certain foods or preservatives could plausibly react to some of these other ingredients. Um, but we haven't seen widespread evidence of that happening in population. Um, in animal testing and in studies of people that are um, sprayers or work with this um, occupationally, um, the formulated spray is slightly irritating to the eyes and the respiratory tract, but overall BTK has a very good human safety record um, in urban areas, and in our opinion, it's the least toxic approach when moth control is needed. Next. I don't see my slide. Up. There it is. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of the health studies um, that I think um, support the conclusions of uh, its low, a low concern for human health. So following spraying in Victoria, BC in 1999, um, health researchers looked for any unanticipated health impacts, um, including had moderate to severe asthma. So they observed them during the spraying to make sure that there wasn't any reaction 
and they didn't see an effect. Um, they also didn't see any increased visits to healthcare providers for asthma, respiratory disease, or skin reactions um, compared to non-sprayed areas. And they didn't see any infections in the general population due to BCK. Um, similar re re results were found following spraying of large tracts um, in New Zealand in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, again, they didn't see any increase in medical visits for a host of diseases. Um, there were some people who self-reported symptoms um, in the spray zone, and um, the New Zealand uh, health folks did follow up with each of those calls, but they were unable to tie the symptoms specifically to the spray or to rule them out. Uh, in Washington um, state, many years of experience with this BTK product has shown that the vast majority of people living in straight areas report no symptoms. Um, we do uh, see a, usually a small percentage of people in straight areas um, calling in and reporting mostly minor symptoms um, like eyes, nose, and throat irritation or worsening of allergies or asthma after the spraying. Um, but we are usually unable to determine whether these are just coinciding with the spring allergy season, which is when they spray for the gypsy moth or the related to pollen or dust disturbed by the, the planes or just unrelated. Oh, and uh, lastly, in animal testing, um, Neither BTK or the formulated product is toxic to mammals, except for at very large doses. And um, uh, this includes some studies that have gone over the whole lifetime of, of, the, uh, of the laboratory animals. So um, public health advice. Uh, we don't expect infection or illness to result in the general population following spraying with BTK. Um, but as a precaution, uh, we urge people to stay inside 30 minutes to allow the bulk of the droplets to settle and um, to let the spray dry on grass before children go out and play. Um, if you do have contact uh, with the spray directly, um, we just urge you to wash it off with soap and water. Um, again, we can't rule out that there might be an individual that has a specific allergy um, to a component of the spray, but again, it's not something we've seen um, widespread. And for people with special health conditions or who, or who have concerns or who are immune compromised, um, we just urge you to, you know, to um, follow our precautions. And if you have concerns, you could talk to your health care provider. Um, we also have information on our website at, at Washington State Department of Health on the gypsy moth and you're welcome to go to that. And if you have health questions, you're welcome to follow up um, with our staff. We're, we're happy to consult with you or your healthcare provider if you have specific questions. So. Thanks and that's, that's all I had, Carla. Thanks Barbara. And I wanna apologize, we're having some technical difficulties over here which keeps shutting off our screen. So we're getting it back up as quickly as we can. Our next speaker is going to be Justin Bush with the Washington Invasive Species Council. Hi, hello everyone. As Carla had mentioned, my name is Justin Bush and I'm the Executive Coordinator of the Washington Invasive Species Council. As background, the Washington Invasive Species Council was established by the state legislature in 2006 and the council is tasked with providing policy level direction, planning, and coordination for combating harmful invasive species throughout the state, as well as preventing others that may be harmful. And to do this, the council convenes state, local, and federal agencies, Native American tribes, and other partners to develop and cooperatively work across administrative boundaries to achieve objectives that will efficiently and effectively stop invasive species, as well as prevent new invasive species from entering Washington state. And the council really does believe that the most cost-effective way to deal with invasive species is to prevent them. And to do this, the council collaborates with educators, businesses, council members, and regional partners to develop policies and programs to pre prevent the introduction of new invasive species to Washington. But it's worth noting that when prevention fails, it's critical that invasive species managers respond quickly and effectively to stop the spread 
and to eradicate the population if at all possible. And um, a great example of that would be what we're discussing here tonight. And in 2009 and in 2017, the Invasive Species Council analyzed the risk and potential cost to Washington State in terms of economic damages as well as environmental damages of over 200 different invasive species that are either in Washington or are near entering Washington. And through this process, Asian and European gypsy moth was identified and then reaffirmed to be one of the highest priority and most threatening invasive species to Washington State. And this proposed eradication by the Department of Agriculture is important to ensuring that gypsy moth does not become established in the state. And establishment of gypsy moth really poses a huge risk through the associated defoliation of trees and are a great threat to our state's natural resources, our urban forests, and threatens the health of our streams and, and waters uh, through defoliating riparian areas. And that indirectly poses a, a risk to salmon and other fish species. And so for these reasons, the Washington Invasive Species Council is fully supportive of this Washington State Department of Agriculture's proposed eradication. And additionally, we, we wish to thank them for this work in protecting our state's economy and natural resources. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, Justin. Our last speaker for the evening will be Clinton Campbell, who is with the United States Department of Agriculture's APHIS program. Yes, thank you very much. Um, the uh, United States Department of Agriculture and the Washington State Department of Agriculture have been cooperators for decades now with regard to gypsy moth detection and eradication activities here in the state of Washington. And this is because as stated on the USDA APHIS PPQ uh, gypsy moth webpage, uh, it says the following. The goals of USDA APHIS PPQ are to define the extent of the gypsy moth infestation, to eradicate isolate populations, and to limit the artificial spread of gypsy moth beyond the infested area through quarantines and an active regulatory program. So this in short is why uh, this cooperative relationship has uh, continued for many years. Thanks, Lynn. So a couple of things, we're wrapping up here, but um, you know, there's a lot of information you can learn still about gypsy moth. There's a lot more out there. We have, you know, pages and pages of information on our website, which is agr.wa.gov slash gypsy moth. I also really want to emphasize the importance of signing up for our, either our email, our text, or robocall alerts, because if this uh, uh, project is uh, finalized and goes forward, then the only way to get those notifications, those like 24 to 48 hour notifications that we anticipate spraying an area, is to sign up for those email, text, or robocall alerts. Um, we'll have no other way to send out that information in a timely fashion so that people will be aware. Um, we also have a lot of blogs, both on our agency blog and on that um, Gypsy Moth main webpage. There's a link to all the many blogs we've written about Gypsy Moth. And of course, you can always follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And um, we're constantly sharing information about that, especially as we're getting closer to these proposed eradications. We'll have a lot of information about Gypsy Moth um, as, as we get closer. So I see one question. There's a question about, does it affect frogs and tadpoles, and do I need to cover my frog ponds? Jim, you want to answer that one? I'm sure we're talking about BTK. Uh, yes, there is no evidence that it is going to harm uh, amphibians at all, so uh, they should be safe. And just one uh, clarifying question on that. Um, when you were talking earlier, mentioned impacting potentially adult moths and butterflies. Does it impact um, adult moths and, moths and butterflies or just their caterpillars? It would uh, 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 impact any uh, moth or butterfly who is feeding either adult or uh, larvae during that uh, stage. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, if you do have any other questions, please pop them in the chat box right there and we'll be happy to answer those um, as we wrap up here. Um, we'll wait just a minute and we'll, have, we'll let Jim kind of go through this conclusion here and then we'll answer any other questions that might come in. 
So uh, just in conclusion, some key points that uh, currently Gypsy Moth, uh, Washington State is a Gypsy Moth free state. We are considered pest free. Our goal is eradication to eradicate every single individual within a small isolated population that gets introduced into our state. We have a 45 year record of success in keeping Gypsy Moth out of Washington State and we can intend to continue with that uh, and uh, with our current Gypsy Moth proposal. Um, we only have a small window of opportunity to eradicate Gypsy Moth whenever it's introduced into a state. So it is important to catch Gypsy Moth populations very early and conduct an eradication program. So with that, uh, I'll conclude and answer any questions that you might have. You're welcome, question, or you're welcome, Karen. Thanks for participating. Again, if we wrap up, and uh, or if you're watching this on a recording at a future date, you can always send questions to gypsymoth at agr.wa.gov, or you can call our Gypsy Moth hotline at 1-800-443-6684. And there's a question about what is the difference between 4A48B and BTK? She's seen some articles online um, about both. So can you explain the difference between those two? Well, there are uh, several uh, private companies that produce uh, the uh, biological insecticide that includes BTK and 4A48B represents a specific formulation that is made by a specific uh, company bioscience and uh, so they are in fact one and the same. So 4A48B is a specific formulation of BTK that we use in our program. I hope that answered your question, Kathy. I'm not aware of Canada or anywhere banned. I don't think any, any country has banned uh, BTK or, or 48B. I know that uh, British Columbia has used BTK on numerous occasions. Okay, I think that's all of the questions. Let me just review the chat box here. Yeah, I think that's it. So again, we just wanna thank everyone for participating in the webinar today. We hope to have this up online within about a week and then it'll be available for anybody who wasn't able to participate this evening. So we wish you all a very good evening and please don't hesitate to contact us if you do have any other questions.